Uh, again, wonderful to be back face-to-face uh, -face with all you folks. Uh, once again, absolutely love this community. I uh, love this conference. I've um, been going here for quite a while. Um, so let's get into this a little bit. I think uh, slides are up. Wait for the slides to come up really quick. Anyway, though, like, kind of like what Rob was saying, um, where are we before we get going on here, really th this presentation is about um, you know, using what you have built into the devices. Uh, so really around uh, the PLC, uh, building out libraries for types of detection capabilities and those kind of things. And so we put a lot of, um, we as in Gloria has done almost most of it here, but put in a lot of work around how to leverage what you have built into these devices. Instead of going out and buying new components, uh, products and those kind of things, it's about building in those capabilities within it. I think we're waiting on slides still. Stall, Roger. Uh, I, I can stall, no. So, so really what we're doing around this as well is, um, you know, building out these capabilities. And, and as you'll see, as we get into the deck, um, some a lot of the capabilities are around uh, you detecting things such as you know the, the position of key, your key switch in, in the in the PLC. It's around looking at detections from a memory perspective, uh, looking at detections from a networking perspective, such as how many connections that you may have, uh, what has changed in your firmware and your firmware versions, and all, all those kind of things. Um, so actually building out the, those capabilities and informing the people, uh, operations folks, um, you know, and also your security folks. Anytime I look at tools and capabilities, I always look at what are the use cases for them. A lot of times we'll, we'll deploy a security tool or solution. And from there, um, you know, you, you, you got to think of, okay, so what is the end goal? Who is going to be the recipient of this information? Is it my operations folks? Maybe, maybe it's technicians or is it, um, you know, my security folks? So, a lot, so some of the capabilities that, uh, you know, you were building out was around, you know, ensuring that that information would go to uh, operations from that HMI perspective and then also to your security folks from a logging and monitoring perspective. Anything to add on that one? Yeah, besides those ones, we create also some capabilities for operations for process. So we have some kind of alarms that are going to be more for security than process or safety. And we are separating those to, in order to, to say to the operations that they know if it is safety, if it is actually process or if it is security, because if you start mixing up all of them, then is when the operations will not know what to do or how to act if they have to consider that that's an incident response or not. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. All right, slides are up. Let's get rolling. Uh, here's me, uh, just a little bit of background. So like Rob said, I've been in the in this space for a couple of years, uh, working in oil and gas mostly, but now with Drago, it's been in the Drago a year and a half. Um, privileged to work with this uh, company. Uh, and, and here I've been doing a lot more from the manufacturing perspective. From a SANS perspective, I um, am now starting to help teach the ICS 612. I uh, absolutely love that course. And a lot of these uh, examples and that kind of stuff is kind of carried over into that course as well. So if you're taking that course, uh, you're going to have an awesome week ahead of you. And, uh, and you may think about some of these things as you go through that. So in my case, I started in, in OT. I am like new in cybersecurity. So I, I work over 15 years as a control systems engineer. I work with Siemens for several years. And then I work also for other integrators. And mostly most of my job was doing uh, basic engineering, digital engineering. Also, I was doing the software for the PLCs, HMIs, DCS, and I, and I did commissioning a startup and things like that. And my latest jobs, I work more for metal industry, but I also have worked with other industries like water, uh, oil and gas, cement, etc. And so after that, I started uh, studying in cybersecurity with Georgia Tech and, and in a boot camp. And then I, I did certification with Grid and Security Plus and also I went to the SANS ICS 612 that I really recommend that training if you want to learn more about PLCs. Awesome. Uh, so kind of like I said, we've, we've kind of gone over this already, kind of doing an intro, but, it, but really, you know, what we'll begin kind of going through on this uh, slide deck is looking at those, um, you know, security functions from the scope and strategy aspect, 
um, you know, using and, and really using built-in capabilities of the device. Um, here, we're not, we're not you know, building out anything that's, that's not there. We're just using what, what is there and, and essentially what you can uh, do back, at your, you know, back in your jobs. Um, looking at uh, building those detection libraries, doing something that can actually be reused as well. So it's not just you're building a capability in one area, but you are able to export it and you leverage it throughout your install base. Uh, look at a couple of use cases and demos. So we have a quick demo uh, video and then uh, some of the takeaways you can kind of be thinking about as we go through. So as I mentioned before, and again, we probably have about an hour's worth of material and less than 30 minutes. So I'll be kind of rolling through this really quickly um, just from the normal sans phase here. But nevertheless, what we were thinking about when we're getting into this really is, again, the, the, the security functions and the capabilities, what we want to be doing is to involve the operational staff. Um, and the reason why is because when you think about it, anytime you're putting a tool out there or a capability, who, again, like I mentioned, is who is the recipient? It is, and who do you want to have that awareness quickly when something is going wrong with that device? It's operations. So getting something in front of operations quickly. It's also, like I mentioned before, it's about moving uh, you know, alarms and log information out to your security uh, staff for further analysis or even instant investigation. Um, so, you know, teams in Dragos do uh, quite a few a bit of incident investigation and having the capability of actually looking at what happened to that device is really, really important. And really what we're again doing is looking at visibility down at the lower levels in the Purdue model. So down in here, at, when you think about, you know, where your controller is, level one. Um, and so that's where we're getting the analysis is down at the factory floor. So again, the guiding strategy here is a couple of three, you know, three key things that we're looking at uh, when we're looking at this is really um, leveraging security and detecting those security events, but you wanna do it apart from process and safety. So if we're at a security conference, security is extremely important, but just as is important is making sure that you're um, detecting process events and safety events and they're separated. Also, another guiding strategy was using inbuilt uh, capabilities within the device. So such as, you know, uh, very familiar with Rockwell, uh, there's also Siemens in the, in the house, other, other vendors. It's using standard built-in capabilities um, and standard system calls. So like within Rockwell, it's a, you know, get system value, those kind of things. And also ensuring that, you know, that never, even though we want to, um, put in this security capability, it's ensuring that we're not taxing the device that it can't do its main function. And that main function is the process and safety capabilities. So when we think about this is, is you know, when, when we think about the difference between process and uh, safety and um, security, kind of think about these couple of different um, use cases here. So where we have like on safety, we would have, um, you know, an e-stop. So a safety type of event may be where you're, it's detecting some sort of an e-stop. It may, it may be like a high, high level coming up into a shutdown type scenario. Um, you know, we can think about machinery where you have a guard in place, uh, where there's a, you know, a line door unlocked or something like that. From an operations perspective, this is your normal operating uh, events, such as when you have a tank high level, uh, you know, you have, could have motor events um, on like a motor drive, uh, you know, sequence faulted on those kind of processes. But then when we get into security aspect is where it, 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 we are now beginning to differentiate. So even though we're using a process variables and alarms, we're looking at things such as that set point delta uh, difference. So when, um, you know, there's a set point on an HMI and all of a sudden, you know, it's changed or somebody is trying to change it perhaps to a, a much, much greater value than it really should be. Uh, we can think about like, on a, like again, uh, you know, we're using the use case of a boiler, but uh, you, you pick your process and all of a sudden that key switch just changed position from maybe uh, you know, a, a, a local run to a remote or different types of remote events going on. That's probably something that you should be aware of and, and within your environment. And also range manipulation. I know Jeff has talked about this and uh, uh, Jeff Shear and different talks around coming up and actually manipulating the front end of your data and your data genesis is where you're actually manipulating that, you know, maybe an analog input value, uh, something like that. So, and those things can happen. Moving forward, so again, we think about some of these functions, again, using Rockwell as an example, uh, you can, you know, again, choose your vendor in, in this slide. 
But essentially, like from a Git system value, we can understand, uh, you know, again, what's going on from a module diagnostics and those kind of things. From messaging, um, that's where we're getting logs and generation or we're actually pushing information out uh, to the consumer. Could be a, you know, it could be a, on a memory card, could be from a syslog, uh, you know, whatever data uh, consumer you have. Audit value uh, on the Rockwell specifically, this is where you can uh, understand what, what has changed within the, the firmware, uh, within the, the program. Uh, this is really tied though down to uh, the, the firmware version you're running. So if you're running an older version, I think than 20 uh, is, uh, you probably aren't going to be able to get much out of this if you've upgraded and you should uh, upgrade to above 20 uh, up into the, I think they're now 32. Um, Anyway, you'll, there's a lot of rich information on auto value. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, leveraging that. And of course, for regular functions, this is where we're just doing comparisons on values and range, range values, looking at inputs and so forth. And again, uh, you know, as a Siemens example, this is like a function jump, uh, block or a uh, control charts and that kind of stuff, uh, just as a representative example. So again, what is a library? So we've used the term a couple of times. A library is really those that built-in functionality that, that somebody or the manufacturer has created. You can think of a library as an object. So for those who are, are used to object-oriented programming, you, you have this object, it has properties, methods, and events. You instantiate that object within your code. And then that object now, you have inputs and outputs and you have different methods within it. But inside of it though, there's a lot of built-in capabilities. And so when we talk about libraries in this discussion, what we're really looking at is, or what you can kind of liken it to, is for those who have programmed DCS systems or even SCADA systems that may have function block type capability. Uh, you also have this, again, um, Rockwell, for example, the plant packs, the, the Siemens PCS7, uh, take your vendor, take your pick. If you're familiar with function blocks, this is exactly what we're doing, but we're building function blocks in for these security purposes. So what is building a library? Building a library is pretty much, first thing that you have to think is, think about your external parameters. What do you want your engineers to put in there? So such as scans, such as, such as the limitations, things like that. And then use the main function. So the functions that Mike was talking, that we have the GSD, the message, or, yeah, and, and the audit value. So that, that, those, uh, those systems uh, blocks are bringing all the information that you require to build up your, um, your block. And then just create a simple logic. As you can see here is just normal uh, open and closing contacts and I have coils to detect the, the key switch. And then what are the internal tags? The internal tags are very important because those are the ones that are inside built up in your block and those are the ones that are cannot easily manipulated if you have them uh, blocked. And then we have the outputs. In this case, it's gonna be the, the HMI alarm status as outputs. And from there, that is what you get. So you get, we call it library, but you can also call it like embedded logic. And then that's what you are getting. As you can see, you, in this case, you have your, your tag and that's it. And then the alarms. You can also plug in inside the part of the alarms just to nobody knows what it is actually inside of your block and then bringing that information just to the HMI. So what is the benefits of having the embedded logic? In the case of, of Rockwell, we call it AOIs, and those AOIs, you cannot change it when you are online. So if the, if the attacker or somebody wants to change that block, they have to download that to do the, the changes. And that is very noisy, right? Because everything is gonna stop and then you will realize that something is happening. And then and in the case of Siemens, when you are using function blocks, then the logic cannot be seen if you are blocking those, those, uh, those blocks. And then you create also your own library and then you cannot see what it's inside and you cannot change that information. Uh, as I said, the logic can be protected from read and writes by using, in the case of Rockwell, you can use the sourcing protection. So this is just a file when you put the blocks that you want to protect. And then that file, you take it out from the computer and, and nobody can get into those blocks because they don't have that file. So another thing is those blocks can be imported easily between projects. So you just have to take that block that you have created 
and import it to another project, change just the tag maybe, or use the same tag. And that's it, you don't have to create or copy all the, all the routines that you have created, like for moving, for doing like motors or things like that. You just create like an AOI or a library and that's it. And the logic, another advantage is like, what you have created is already tested. It's not something that you are gonna create on, uh, on site and you are gonna start testing there. This, because you cannot change the, that logic, you will have already tested and you have already created a lot of use cases to make that, these things work. And then we have the level one monitoring. So actually this image, I took it from another guy that it's also helping in this effort and he's Alejandro Cadena and he helped with this. We wanted to show how do we actually monitoring what Mike was talking at the beginning between safety, security and, and, and process. So in this case, as you can see, the machine control actually is the one we monitoring the, the parts that are going to the devices that, for example, you have like a, a call car and then the call car, you send the signal and then you don't receive the movement of the call car. And that is what you are monitoring on the machine control. And then you have the quality control. The quality control is more for continuous process. When you are monitoring your level, your temperatures, your flows, and then, in the upper level, then you have the part that is in safety. Okay, and the quality control, you are checking also what it is on the sequencing. So because the sequencing, I controlling what you have in the machine control, then you have another, another layer in there. And on the top level, then you have the safety monitoring. So the safety monitoring <coughs> is doing actually the coordination, the part helping with the coordination and execution. And this one will be like the first priority. So if something is happening in that safety monitoring, everything stops. Like we were saying, if you have an e-stop or if you have like uh, somebody enters like a cage or something like that, it will stop immediately. And it is managing what you have in your process. And then we have library classification. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, so from library classification perspective, like what we were talking before, we have the, the security function. So when you think about this, when you're building out the library, you know, part of this is from the performance. So you have multiple different types of, uh, of functionality of what you're building out. Control performance here, you're looking at, again, what we were talking about, CPU cycles, memory usage, those kind of things, read writes. Uh, the, the next one is really around the operational aspects. And then finally, it's looking at um, you know, risk of abuse or misuse, or looking at those use cases where, um, where an adversary could be, again, manipulating input values, um, the, the, the information that's coming over the wire, um, you know, it, you know, getting in the middle of HMIs, uh, those kind of things. And then when you implement these things, you also have to think about um, how your security functions can be disabled. So another part of this is actually implementing security handlers or so you have a security block and now I have a, another block that's actually monitoring the, the, my security block to make sure that somebody hasn't disabled or compromised this. And um, essentially what this does allows you through this effort, um, again, to create security logs and also um, move uh, you know, security logs. So when you think about security logs, normally we think about syslogs, you're thinking about um, other aspects like that. The security log, so is something that um, actually kind of Glory kind of worked out, and we'll talk about this in an upcoming slide, where we're looking at um, taking all these the main security functional information and able to ship those out to a consumer. So from a library classifications perspective, like I said, from a when you think about this from a controller performance perspective, we have here a, a memory usage where, um, you know, over here you have, you, under memory usage, you have uh, looking at, at how much memory has been used. You may be looking at it to see if something has been, um, you know, changed, uh, you know, increased cycle uh, scan rates and those kind of things. Uh, another one is active connections. This is actually one that is still kind of, we're working to build out, but this is an in interesting one where a lot of these devices will track how many open connections it has. So almost like running a NetStack command on the PLC, if you will. And so you can, you can leverage this to understand, okay, do I have more active connections now or am I begin messaging some new information to another device? Uh, and then of course, finally on again, like program execution. So understanding um, from one scan to the next, how much has changed? So is, is my scan cycle um, not consistent? 
which may be an indication that somebody could be tampering with the device. And again, um, a lot of this is around, you know, using baselines of detection, that kind of stuff. So you, uh, you understand your device, you create a, a normal baseline, and then from there, uh, you put that base, those baseline values in and, and understanding what's changed from that baseline. So we have the process operation. So on the process operation, this one is more to focus on the security side. So as we said, uh, if you send like a, a, like a command and the valve is not opening, that doesn't mean that it is security. Maybe your valve just got stuck or we are not receiving the correct value from the sensor. So we create uh, some uh, blocks here that it's more through security. And one of them is the change in operations, reference values or the set points. And this came more if normally what you have in your set points, you have like a big range and then you can move through, through, through that range. We don't want to mess up with the, with the engineers telling them you have to close your set points because sometimes the operations will need to have that. So we create this block saying, but maybe in this time you are always using this difference between the set points. So if you have the difference on this set point is when the alarm will come. And also this block will help you to change if you needed to change it later that as a different range. We will see it in another example. And then we have the operation limits. So as we know, most of the engineers should be putting the, the operation limits hard-coded. So if somebody changed that, those limits, then it's, it is when it is detected. Also, we create in this block, we are, again, we have to be open to the customer and say, well, we can use the HMI. But in this case, if you are using the HMI, then, because it is very easy that somebody can take and then do like acknowledge, we are detecting that somebody is changing that value. And then from there, we just change, um, we just generate a log and then we remove the alarm. This is one of the ways. And the other way is that, that you can hardwire that acknowledge. It's not good to have that because you will have to think about wiring and, uh, and other stuff. So here is one of the use cases. We took it in for, a, for a profiling in, a, in an electric furnace. So if you, uh, we have it in the red colors, the, the limitations. So one of the things that this block has is that you can lock those values, those limitations. So if, if it is locked, means that you cannot change, if you, ch you cannot change what it is inside of this block. So the limits that you have already set it up. And once the, the, somebody came and the, comes and then change this lock, then we, you will have those alarms that it's maximal change or minimal change, or it could be both. But the operator will receive just one of those or depending what it has. And this is the use case. We are using the same profile heating that's, and this is for the set points. So in this case, the set points different monitoring, what it is doing is we have in the first block in, in green, that is what is the <clears throat> what it is adding every time that a heat is coming then it will add one so you can use it also these ones for the process and detect if actually what you are calculating is real or not so in this case you are incrementing just by one and if you increment by two for example it's when the alarm will come up and then you can change that as well. And it is not that you are gonna use it in this kind of cases. And in the demo, I will show you that you can use it also for set points in a, in a PID and things like that. And also this block, what it has is that you can change. So this one will accept the next step. And then it says, okay, I have the new value and then I can increment another value and things like that. You have to be very open when you are talking about doing blocks for process. And then we have the risk of misuse. Yep. So as we kind of go through here, you know, one of my favorite ones, of course, key switch detection, because understanding what, what position your key switch in, uh, that, that, you know, uh, local run, uh, the intermediate position, which is um, remote, can be remote run, remote pro program, and then program. Um, it's really important to understand that. And a lot of folks don't know, don't know the position of their, their keys in their process environment. But you can easily understand that by, again, leveraging that uh, get system value and the status bits and that, and then again, leveraging a block and library such as that to understand what, what, where, where are you at uh, within your devices. Um, also, again, when we look at, uh, you know, again, program firmware, um, 
you can do the same thing looking at the, at the, the system value with, with uh, you know, grabbing that information off. Uh, you can do that remotely as well. And so we have a block for that to go out and get that, that information, to store it, to understand if it's changed or not. Um, again, here's just a representation where you have a get system value and where you're checking. Um, and you can actually do this, like I said, remotely as well, where you're looking at maybe a firmware revision of, of a certain number. You know, firmware just shouldn't just change. Uh, unless, uh, unless there's actually been a managed manage change type process or somebody is doing some manipulation type things. Uh, but here again, looking at just looking at differences and you can again, look at do this remotely as well. Um, from a program download online changes again, looking at this is kind of where you're getting back to that, uh, the ability capabilities built into the device. Um, looking also at performance and controller, uh, you know, functions. And here again, looking at scan and memory such as what we've talked about before. I just have to add for the scan cycle, we're still working on that one because we have like an issue when you do the detection in different scan cycles. So if you put like a change in one before or, or later, you, you cannot detect sometimes a change. So that one is like one of the use cases that we're still like working. Yeah. And then we have the security handler. So these ones are the ones that are actually checking the other blocks and are also locking the blocks. So we have the event severity. So we create a block that is actually checking what are the events that you can have, you, you can create like, if I have this one and this one and this one means that it's something that it's related to, to security, to cybersecurity, and then we can send that alarm as a, a medium high or low level. And then we have the monitoring fun uh, the functions. This monitoring is if you delete one of the security blocks, then it will detect that uh, using another PLC as well. So you have like, like we are normally used in a communication between PLCs, we use like heartbeats. So we are using just heartbeats between the blocks to detect if one of the blocks is, is delivered. And then we have the initialization parameters. This one is, is a bit that it is actually just inside as a local, it is inside as a local value. And then once you lock that, it means that you cannot change it, but you need to block your blocks. Otherwise it won't work. <laughs> So this is the, the, the one that it is doing the, the locking. So as you can see, it's just a, a one, uh, sh one shoot pulse and then it will lock so that those data that are in the moving, those ones are the ones that are, cannot be um, later changed by anybody. So once you have that, you cannot like say, now I want this parameter instead of this one. And then the block, it's gonna work in, uh, using those parameters. And then we have the severity block functionality. So they, this is like a new block that we recently re released. And then we have the numbers of events. We have up to five events. And then we have two ways to, to detect. One is by triggering and another one is by timing. So triggering it's more used when you want to, to have like several uh, events like process. And timing is more like when you want to detect when you have like performance or you have like the key switch or do you have like downloads and things like that. In, in the case on the PLCs, you cannot monitoring for the entire time. So you have to, to set up some kind of trigger. And in this case it's like trigger or time. And then we have the event hold time. This is for, for more for the security and you are deciding how long are you gonna uh, detect th those changes. And then we have the validation error parameters and this one is you need to have several information like for example the event number that what is going to be your trigger things like that otherwise this block will send you just an error that you have not configured correct the blocks and then we have the number of events detected uh, they, this is more to counting what are the events that you have detected uh, through the through the time of the trigger and then this, those are the alarms that the operations will get. They will get high, medium, and low. And, low. and this is the, the, an example. So in this case, I just select that I have two, uh, two, two events. And then I have just like an alarm for event one. So that is a, a low because I don't have any other. And then I'm having here, like I detect the two severities. And that means that we are having a high severity. And what are we doing and what are we working right now is to create some kind or also to say, what is the weight of each event? So if I want like the event two is like a higher event, 
then I will say, okay, this is the Heiger event. I will immediately go to high, even though I have just one, one detector. And this is kind of the, of the configuration and the idea in here, you will have to define those events with your security team, your process team, your mechanical team, and also your process, uh, your control engineers to, to do this thing. So the severity rate will be calculated on the selection of the events. Yeah, for this moment. Yeah, and just like kind of like we were saying before is um, where you actually put your security monitoring in is in that coordination and execution block and, and area within the environment. And this is how, how you program, where do you put your library? So your library, you will put it in the 100 milliseconds or 10 hundred milliseconds. So if you have, for example, a process, you will put your process block inside of where it is actually, because you don't want to mess up of one, what are you receiving from your process. So in this case, because you have your time control in the 100 milliseconds, then your block is uh, for the, the delta set points, you will have it inside of the 100 milliseconds. And from there, we have the monitoring block. So the monitoring block in this case is checking the other one that actually exists. So if it doesn't exist, it will send an alarm. And that one, it is detecting in the, in the 10, 100 milliseconds. The thing that we wanted to have it in the lower, lower scan cycle, it is because the lower the scan cycle, the more difficult that an attacker can actually do like man manipulation of your data. And then you have, again, the heartbeat, and that one goes to another PLC. The other PLC is detecting that one. So if, in case you lose this one, then you will lose everything. Then you will alarm that anything that you have there is like reliant. And the, all of those blocks contain the monitoring block, and also they have the, the flash bit that it says uh, the, the parameters are already locked. Awesome. So from when you think about um, from the security scans, uh, scan cycle routine, what you have here is again on, on the, the firmware and the memory side, um, you have those being generated uh, within the security area. Um, from there, it feeds over into the handler monitoring block. Again, each one of these would have their own um, monitoring blocks to understand if, if that uh, security block is working. And that would come again off of the out of security um, area. Moving forward, uh, you have a, a severity block, a handler block that's is looking at those severity calculations like uh, Gloria described. And then from there, that also feeds back into that monitoring block as well. So each one of these would have their own uh, monitoring like I mentioned before. From the scan cycle routine though, again, what, what Gloria had mentioned is, um, is the scan cycle, like when you're doing key switch and those kind of things, um, normally you don't put something in the main task. It's not, it's not a common programming practice. In fact, you try not to do that. The main task should schedule all the other lower level subroutines. But on the security monitoring one, um, we had some really challenging aspects of trying to detect when that switch would be used. So um, nevertheless, we had to put it back into the main program. So that's another area we need to be working on a little bit more. But of course this has a handler monitoring block and that monitoring block is being called from the security area. Uh, and again, this, this one in particular, you, the, the logic has to be initialized when the key is rotated to program mode and then back to run mode, then this logic can be uh, you know, kicked off, if you will. This is just an example of that, that log forwarding like we were talking about, leveraging 450 bytes. And now why did we choose that? That's actually the range that uh, the Rockwell uses for doing log transmission. And so here we're just using some of the built-in capabilities of all those, those functions, building in, a, if you will, almost a, a protocol a log pro or a log uh, format uh, using the memory and the firmware, the different data elements and those kind of things. And this can all be transmitted with UDP. Um, let you speak to this. <laughs> so th this is the, what, I, what I, we, we used to create the, the libraries. As you can see, it's just a Rockwell PLC. And, Compact logics, and then we have a, a PLC that I got from the, the science here, uh, the, the 612, and that is the validator PLC. And well, that one checks uh, the monitoring and also is checking the firmware for the other PLC. And then we create a little demo with that. And we're only going to be able and, to go through a little bit of the demo, I think, for about a time already. So, okay. okay. So what we are representing here, we have two types of alarm. 
Normally you will not have this just to highlight it. So in, in one of the sides, you can see the one that it says, K, uh, the one in the arrow, that one is actually telling you that is security and the other one is more safety and process. And then what I create here is uh, hysteresis. Well, this one is detecting the key switch. And then we have the alarm because right now it is in remote mode. And what I create here, it was a hysteresis control loop. And then I have, I have also a PID for, for level. And we are gonna test here the, the process functions. So this one is the, the difference, the Delta one. So as you can see, I have prepared the base set point as 10, and then the difference is also 10, 10 units, and then we don't have any alarm. So I'm gonna change that value. So I'm changing it to 50, and then immediately the alarm, it, came, it comes. It takes a little bit on the HMI side, but at the end, that is what the operator will see, and they immediately will know this is not normal. Now I'm changing back to the five, and then the alarm will just go away. You don't need to do any acknowledge or things like that. And that is registered actually in the logs right now. <clears throat> and then I'm changing to 65 to get a, an, an, an alarm. This is the case when the operator decides that it is the time and what they need to use another kind of, of separation. So they, they can put that acknowledge to another screen that it's locked or something like that. And then you remove that alarm and now your range is gonna be between 65 plus 10 minus 10. So if I go back to five or 10, well, in this case, I went to 12, I got the, I got the alarm. So it's like, you have to be very flexible in those kind of things as well. <clears throat> so the, now I'm gonna just, because I want to get rid of that alarm, I will go just to 73 then I just don't have the alarm anymore. And then we are gonna test uh, the other block that it's for the limits. So this one are the limits that are already locked. So you can see you have 15 and 10, and those are to testing the hysteresis block. So this is just some kind of logic for the hysteresis when you use like open or close a valve in certain values and in this case is a heater and a cooling valve. So I'm changing the values here and as, as soon as I change all of them, then I will have the alarms. In one, and in one of them, in the heaters, I'm changing both of them. In the valves, I'm changing just one value to demonstrate that you don't want to have a lot of alarms. So what I'm putting here is just, I have detected for the heater, the both alarms, and then I'm detecting for the valve, just the maximal one. So it's a little bit slow, but it's going. And yeah, I'm, I'm just changing there the, the here part and then now I'm downloading. This is online, everything. As you can see on the valve, we are having the maximal and in the, in the here we having both. So you don't want to saturate the operators with, with a bunch of alarms. And now you want to, to take that back. So you create, you just go back to that one and then you change the values. And as soon as you remove those, you can change it. And as I said before, this block has a capability to also use, not when it is just the value hard coded, it could be also from the HMI, but the acknowledge is different. And now we are gonna test uh, what is the key switch. And in this case, we have it already in program mode. So we have the alarm already in program and this is the block that we are getting. So in program, and then we have also a red square over there that it is displaying that. And this one I changed to program remote. I, I, I don't do that difference because to me program is always program. So I just keep it as program. No, any alarm, it would be like the same thing anyway. And we are gonna change it to local. It has a little bit on my block, like a delay in there with the alarm. So you see, we don't have alarms. We have the green and then we have the local mode. And this is, those are the monitoring blocks. So as you can see in your uh, right side, you will see that there is a, the bit that it will disable. So I'm gonna disable that one. 
And the block that it is on the left, it's going to detect that and it will send the alarm. So that, that means that your block, your safety, your key switch block, is, it has been deleted or it has been disabled or your tag is, has, it is not there anymore. And as I said, it's just like some kind of heartbeat in there. And now I'm going, going to do the other one. And then the, the click, the other PLC is the one that it is checking what it is happening. As you can see, the FP is the feedback that I'm sending to the other PLC. And now I'm not receiving that, so I'm sending that alarm as well. Kind of that remote monitoring capability that we were talking about before. I think we're at time, so let's roll forward on the demo and okay. uh, have a little look at the takeaway. Um, so, um, and again, there was more to that demo, um, which could have showed you, but I know we're kind of at time, but nevertheless, so when we think about this, um, you know, and, and one of the key takeaways is just ensure that um, when we implement these uh, types of functionalities within our, within our systems, when we are thinking about putting in built-in security capability within our systems that are actually running the process and environment, we need to be thinking about ensuring that they interact independently from process and safety. And also making sure that the alarming capability and those kind of things are separate from you know, process and uh, safety type of as as aspects such as that. So what I encourage everybody is like develop a library, not just for your detections, also for your processes. It's easy to handle, it is easy to work on that. And also you are ensuring that what you are programming, it is actually tested. And it also protects against modifications and as you can see is external sources to verify function integrity. Absolutely. And also um, you, looking at and, and using the um, aspect of parameterized libraries and look and this is kind of like code, you know, hiding code within an object, if you will. So when you're using this, um, you're not accessing those variables inside of, of that object or inside of this library, you're using parameterized type, type capabilities where you're, you're putting in a new library uh, or uh, reusing that library as Gloria just mentioned, and you're parameterizing the inputs so you can just assign values to them and then use those within the, um, your new code. And of course, this is not bulletproof. Um, your PLC has to be like in the lower, it's part of your crown jewels. So it has to be one, it is, so what we are showing is just one part of a defensive in-depth strategy or it's not like, oh, I have this and nothing is gonna happen, of course not. So work also in your other control security. Absolutely. All right, uh, so with that, we use a couple of resources during this uh, effort uh, and those kind of things. And once again, thank you very much. Really